big swings. And now, here it comes. Oh, my goodness. seen anything like that big moments there it is adam scott a life changer all the news all the views the career grand slam a launch to Kai webb welcome to the pga golf club and welcome to another edition of the PGA Golf Club. It's uh, Adam White, Brendan Goddard, and Nick O'Hearn with you this week. Now, I've got to say, while I remember this, because I always forget, for those that are enjoying this program, and I know there's a lot of you out there because we're getting some fantastic feedback on the program, when you get... Now, I'm not very technical. This. <laughs> Brendan, you are, so you can might be help. You've got to do, like, ratings. Get on the so iTunes stuff. app yes, or download the podcast and yeah. give us a rating. So you, like, go, five do stars, five-star ratings. Give us a review if you like. That's right. Give us some feedback, positive, negative. Yep. We're all grown well, men not here. Not negative, just positive. <laughs> well, room for improvement. Room for improvements. Yes, that's so you, you like see, that sort of stuff. Correct. You got the 360 feedback. Yes, all for it. And, and uh, yeah, give us a review and feedback. Yep. So uh, I know that there's been a few times where we've been in the charts. Which Have is we? quite exciting. Absolutely. Oh. So, and that's with not telling anyone to do that sort of five-star business. <laughs> so whatever you do, whatever you have to do, please do it because um, just because it's a good thing to do. It's a nice thing to do. And it makes um, you feel good about well, it yourself that, and makes us feel good about the program. Exactly right. So you can do it a number of different ways. I've just been told we can do it through iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, of course, the RSN website, the PGA website site, and also iHeartRadio. So there's plenty of ways to access uh, the PGA Golf Club. Uh, we're absolutely enjoying uh, what we're doing, and it's great to have Nick O'Hearn coming back uh, to have a chat to us. Nick, thanks for being in the studio with us. No worries. Thanks for having me again. Now, we're going to be really sort of self-indulgent here, Lincoln, <laughs> because uh, Brendan and I and you, we're going down to play at Royal Melbourne today mm. as part of the President's Cup build-up. It's the big media day. The, apparently, the grandstands are up, so we need to, oh. we need to perform appropriately, Brendan. Um, we can aim for the grandstands and just get free drops and yeah, that's right. Like, like Tommy Fleetwood did last night. Um, so, just oh, we're really excited about going down there, particularly to play at the composite course. You've played the golf course so many times. Do you still get excited going to Royal Melbourne to play golf? I do. Every time I get an invite, uh, with either through a member or a friend, I'm there. Um, no doubt. It's just for me in Australia, it's it's the best golf course, um, specifically probably the West. Um, but when you put the composite together, it's you know obviously that's the cream of the crop right there. There's not a bad hole on that layout. And interestingly enough, before I moved back here to Melbourne, I only had it had ever played the composite i'd never played the east or the west because <laughs> right. i'd only ever played tournaments yeah, there yeah, yeah. so so to actually get out to play those four holes across the road on the west was like oh my gosh how good's this and um it's just yeah, it's an honor to play out there every time without putting you on the spot why well, actually i'm putting you on the spot are there any holes that you've played <laughs> that you think oh gee that that should be in the composite course that's a fantastic golf hole. Oh, well i mean those four out across the road yeah but the, the composite, obviously, the idea is to keep it all within the one property mm. because you usually have to cross roads to get over to the other other holes. I'm actually kind of glad they got rid of the the uphill par three in the corner. Yes, because for a left hander, that's a nightmare of a hole. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't like that. It's a great hole, but I don't like it. So I love the par four before it, where you just yeah. go down into the corner. Beautiful little golf hole, and then now you walk up the hill and you go to the, um, I guess it's the short par three which never used to be in the composite when I first played mm. it. That's, that's just a gem of a hole, that is. It's which which Cor Crenshaw says the best par three in the yeah. world. I think mm. they've well, there was a famous thing about Tom Watson, I believe, when he was at Watson when he was walking around the course, and they said, oh, what's the best par three you've you know ever seen? And I said, oh, well, we actually just walked past it, but it's not in the event. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Because so, yeah. it's funny, as someone that is uh, in the media, I only know it pretty much as the composite. So mm, I can okay. actually visualize and go through every single hole in the composite. Have you played played the composite before? I've I'm lucky enough to play it three or four times, oh. um, but I don't. I I played West once, mm -hmm. and I was completely thrown out of whack. You know that it just didn't because of just you know if, when I would go and cover a golf tournament, I would walk the course probably well, at least twice a day. Uh, and then that's not including practice and then watching it on television. You just know the holes so well because you just walk them. You did, mm. I didn't play them. But I, I wish I could, but I didn't. But it's it's interesting th just that there are 18 other really good holes in that 
composite of, of golf of the golf course. Yeah, the first time I got out to those holes out across in the east, I'm thinking, my goodness, how good is this? I mean, on the entire facility, there there is not a bad golf hole. Yeah. It's just some incredible golf out there. What's your favourite hole? Ooh, well, I love that par three. On the composite, it would be, let's see, one, two, the third hole, mm-hmm. uh, which is, I so think, like the five hole. west, is it? Yes. I think yeah, it's five, five west. west. And then the par four afterwards, again, another left-handers hole. Mm-hmm. I pick all the lefties, you know, and it's just a great stretch there. You go up the par three yeah, after that, yeah, yeah. up the hill. Again, just a beautiful little golf hole. And the shortest holes are, interestingly enough, the ones that you remember the most. You know, those long 500-yard par fours, which there really aren't any of those around Royal Melbourne. They're all... Um, either par fives at that distance or the shorter par threes are just they're just incredible because you can have a wedge in your hand around there and 30 feet is a really good shot uh, which on other golf courses it's not this might be sound a silly question but for for you is it an easy golf course because it's so wide and the greens are so big to be able to say score 70 but it's almost impossible at certain times to shoot 65 depending on flag positions and all that sort of thing. Like, do you go there and think, because it's not a particularly long golf course, mm. um, What? how would you as- assess its playability? It really comes down to the weather and the firmness of the greens, uh, which is what I think all great golf courses have. You know, they talk about how do you toughen golf courses up? Firm greens, that's number one thing because then it means you have to be in the right position in the right part of the fairway to actually get access to that to that flag. And that's the beauty of Royal Melbourne is it doesn't matter that they're very wide fairways. You have to be in the right part of that fairway to get to certain pin positions. And, and I've, I mean, I shot 63 around there in the Heineken one 63. year. 63. Uh, the, the one, um, you know, that uh, Craig Parry and I had the playoff in. And, um, and then other times I'm struggling to shoot 74, 75 around there when that northerly comes in, it's starting to blow a bit. And all of a sudden it just, you know, it, it shows its teeth. And you're just fighting to make pars the whole way around. So that's the beauty of Royal Melbourne. It can it can give you a lot, but it can also take away a lot as well. But just what? Well, just, we, before you ask that question, we're, Craig Parry is our special guest today. We're going to talk about Presidents Cup memories. Uh, we might just have to throw that in there, or let Nick, <laughs> let, let, let Nick do that himself. Maybe go into more detail, Nick, about what makes it great. Because I know you speak to a lot of amateur golfers, and they play Royal Melbourne. They go, oh, well, what's What's so good about this? No, it's place? a great. It's a great. This, this, great pl- point. this place is overrated. And yep. you go, hang on, hang on a second. And then, and so the details, and then why? Why is it so good to play as a pro? Well, I think the the great courses everyone can play them. And Royal Melbourne, an eighteen handicapper can go around there and go, yep, I can play this golf courses because the genius of the design is you can run your ball up into most of the into most of the uh, most of the greens, unless it's a short par three or a short par four. The openings of the uh, of the front of the greens uh, are available. You can run your ball up, so the you know the person who can't carry the ball more than a hundred yards can play the golf course. And yet, when you put pins in certain parts of those greens, all of a sudden, it becomes very very difficult. And if you short side yourself around Royal Melbourne, you're staring at an instant bogey, possibly a double. And the way the the bunkering is designed, and the uh, the quality of the greens, the layout, it's just. I don't know. It's almost a spiritual experience as you're walking around there. I, I just, you know, I've got my half set today. I'm going to take out there and have a bit of a bash and, and just enjoy myself. And and I think two great great minds think alike. There got you my go. Pencil bag. Got the pencil bag. Yeah. yeah. Half <laughs> set going on today. You've got yeah. a half set. I will be. Yes. Well, why yeah. would you? How do you have half your clubs? Because it's lighter. It's and you, l- and you don't lighter. need them all. That's the beautiful yeah. part about the game. I think you know they should. Uh, you talk about the game of golf I think they should probably make a 9 or a 10 club rule or something like that right, because okay. you know you don't need 14 clubs <laughs> well, yeah, it makes you hit different shots so I'm playing poorly at the minute so I thought well get less clubs it'll get me more go creative go back to basics and, but uh, and then what was my next question uh, um, so in other words it, it the golf course makes you think a lot more as a mm. professional as opposed to a traditional American style course where it's yep. very much in the air do you want to just explain that and how, how different that is for Sure, Sandbelt sand Golf in particular, and, and Royal Melbourne. I mean, obviously, is uh, is at the top of the list. Is the first thing whenever I'm playing a tournament, if I'm playing around a golf around there, is I might be standing on a par four, and I'm going, "Where is the pin position?" Which most golf courses just don't make you think that way. You just stand there and you bomb it down there on the fairway, and then wherever you are in the fairway, you can probably get access to where the pin is because the greens tend to be softer. If we're talking about American courses and things like that, Augusta National is very much the same way. Um, and Lynx Golf is very much that way as well. You have to come in from the right angle. Uh, that's the beauty of the old course uh, at St. Andrews. 
Royal Melbourne, Kingston Heath, Metropolitan, all those, you stand on the tee and you go, okay, where's the pin position? Because I know I can't get to that pin from a certain spot in the fairway. You can always play conservative golf, play to the middle of the, fair, middle of the fairway, middle of the greens, about sand belt, but you're really going to shoot around par. You're mm. not going to shoot five, unless six, seven hold, under. Unless you hold bombs. Unless you hold 30 footers all day, which, you know, percentage-wise isn't going to be, you know, if you have a great day with a putter, but then if you have a poor day with a putter, you're going to shoot 76 or 77 as a pro. And you've, you hit 15 greens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you can hit lots of greens around Royal Melbourne. The greens are large. There's openings at the front. There's the opportunity, but the scoring is, is very tough because... It depends on where they put the pins, and that's mm. the beauty. I think the President's Cup coming up, I'm going to be fascinated as to where they put their pins. So Todd Woodridge is a good mate of mine, and he's, he says, you know, in our Wednesday comps, we have pins that they never put in pro tournaments. They're so difficult, and I'm thinking, well, why don't they put the Wednesday pin comps for the President's Cup coming up because that'll really test them out. Yeah, it's interesting. With the, the speed of the greens, and we... I mean, I still remember back to the <clears throat> the famous uh, event at Royal Melbourne where Brett Ogle actually hit the ball past the hole and the wind blew it back in. Um, they can get amazingly quick. As a golf professional, do you like them that quick? Does it make it easier to putt on? I mean, because a, a p- person like myself would be terrified by those sort of paced greens. But does that does that help you as a professional? Personally, I liked it because I felt that that sorted out the better putters. Um, the... The, the quicker the greens, the better putter you have to be, I believe. And then, in a way, almost the slower the greens as well because the the Lynx golf courses, like uh, the old course at St. Andrews, you can walk onto a green and not know you're actually on the green. You know, you feel like you're still on the fairway. So slower greens can sort out better putters as well because pace is so important. On quick greens and on very, very slow greens, pace of putt is so important. So... Having that creativity and that imagination to be able to adapt to the conditions in front of you uh, is really important. Now, for the average golfer out there, very, very quick greens are tough um, because they maybe not don't have that feel or that touch or that they can't see the, the, the slopes that come into it. The thing about Royal Melbourne is the greens are fairly... There's not a lot of undulation. They're just nice, gentle, rolling slopes. But because they're so quick, the slopes almost double uh, in a way because your 20-foot putt, which looks like it has three or four feet of break all of a sudden turns into seven or eight feet of break just because of the pace of the greens mm. and that's the beauty of Royal Melbourne if you don't know the greens very well you're going to struggle and, on and, them. and what's uh for the, the listers what's the number one rule at Royal Melbourne well <laughs> keep it below the hole keep there you go the <laughs> wear white exactly. socks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you play to the middle of the greens at Royal Melbourne you're not going to have too much more than the 30 or 40 footer but yeah. you may have a couple of downhillers but in a jazz a general rule you're going to have yeah. so some, some good you looks. know that Whitey today just get a yardage to the front of green and Brendan, just try and hit it at the Brendan, front Brendan I go at every at every flag <laughs> so I'm you you know. I knew you would be like that <laughs> the other thing you have to play for in Royal Melbourne is about 10 yards of release once your ball lands on yes. the green because well, it's very gonna, firm out there I was just about to say that I was very very, very fortunate to play at Royal Melbourne the day after the World Cup final round. and The Jason Day one. Yes. And I could not believe, so unlike Brendan, who only ever plays on the sand belt, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure for me to get to go down there and play. But it was like hitting balls into a turf cricket pitch. Mm-hmm. I could not believe how hard they were. And that was a moment where I realized I probably wasn't going to be a tour player. <laughs> was there was there a moment where you actually... well because I, like there was a couple of the short par three uh, par four holes where I was getting the ball to about fifty meters, and I would get at my my sixty degree lob wedge and think oh this is alright I'm quite close here mm-hmm. land the ball short of the green and it would be off the back mm-hmm. and I I just I couldn't come to terms with the fact that players were able to stop the ball on those greens mm. and. That was probably where I got the greater appreciation of, of a golf professional. Not so much how far they hit it or the shaping of the ball. It's your ability to craft the golf ball around the greens mm-hmm. when they're as fast as they were at Royal Melbourne. Yeah, and that's, you know, you're almost talking, you go back to the Peter Thompson era and he spoke a lot about that. How do you get the ball along the ground to go where you want it to go? Whereas the modern day game is how do you fly it through the air to get, get it there? Mm. And Royal Melbourne takes you back to that that old school style of golf and and you have to have that creativity and imagination because yes you can bomb driver down there but if you're in the wrong spot I'm sorry you can't get the ball close to the hole even if you've got a wedge in your hand and I mean that whole like um, uh, again we're saying six west which is the fourth of the composite I'm going to be fascinated to see what they do with that front left hand pin position if anyone actually goes over that bunker over that bunker because there's going to be a lot of balls running off the front and there's going to be a lot in the back bunker 
it was safe players to play a little bit right and try and two-putt from 30 feet, but the egos of these guys may just say, we're going to go at it and see what happens. So it's well, going to be fun. Yeah, or you've got to have a full shot in with spin, but it's got to be mm. a perfect shot, doesn't it? It's got to land within two or three yards of, of where you want it to land. If you don't, I'm sorry, but you know, yeah, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, And I think that does make the President's Cup such an attractive thing to go and watch because in stroke play, you're more likely to play the conservative mm-hmm. play. Yep. But when it comes to match play, you've got that situation where guys are going to go at more pins because of the, the circumstances. And I think that's what makes it such a an exciting time to go down there and, and sample golf at Royal Melbourne well, if you that's haven't what, or even just watch it on television. So I'd, I'd encourage people, instead of watching on television, to get down to Royal for the things we're talking about. Is about you actually get to see the, the flight, the creativity of these players up close because you don't you don't get to witness that on television and watching on the box. You don't get to see the flight. You don't get to see the shape, particularly around the greens and how they deal with the shots they're going to face. The low spinner, the the high soft one, with this their ability to control the ball to try and get it close to these pins. You don't get to you don't get to witness that. So we can sit there in our lounge room and watch them, but you don't get the full appreciation of how good they are and how good the golf course is and how you need to play it until you actually go watch it up close and personal. So I encourage you all to get out there. Yeah, and Royal Melbourne's one of those venues that if you haven't been there to walk around and witness the course and see the slopes and the bunkering, and, and your, yeah. it's just incredible. It's kind of like trying to explain people what Augusta National is like. People don't realise how severe the slopes are around there and how much variation there is. And Royal Melbourne's very much that way. It's not so much severity there, it's just... The firmness and the speed of the golf course is like no other. It's just incredible. And the great thing about golf is that to go and watch it as a spectator, you can have the best seat in the house. And you know, I, I've mentioned a number of times I'm lucky enough to be in the media for, for golf and you can get to walk the fairways. <laughs> have you mentioned that golf. before? No, no. But no I, I've mentioned it too many times, but I don't care. I'll mention it again. Um, but the, you know, to go and watch – this is really showing off now – but to go and stand behind Tiger Woods at um, – uh, at uh, where was it Kingston Heath and at Victoria, but to see how much he moves the golf ball in the air from left to right and right to left, it, it was a mind blowing experience for someone like me that just loves their golf and had no understanding of how much he moved the ball. But I think we air. all had that perception as a young kid when I didn't watch much golf early days. Dad started taking me down to Melbourne or brought me to Melbourne watching the Heineken Classen, but just to see a ball on television start right and you go, yeah, that's oh, right. that's way right. Yeah, and yeah, this yeah. thing comes down the flag, you go, oh, kind of how did that but happen? That's, that, but, it, but I think it's, maybe it's from playing computer golf or whatever <laughs> it is, but you just think he they would hit just hit the ball shots. dead straight yeah. at the flag uh, to, to six feet put the putt in. But, I mean, you you've exp- with the I was going to say, you've Bubba experienced <laughs> playing with, with them all to, yeah. to know what we're talking about. But, I just it just blew me away that sort of thing that he he I mean others can do it as well. Sure, but Tiger yeah. was just it was yeah. crazy. That what was he was on doing. during the tournament. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I remember him hitting this five iron into sixteen. I remember that week, and he hit this thing, just launched it so high, and it landed like with a butterfly with sore feet. And that's the only way he could get within like mm. five ten mm. feet of this flag. And you know, not you talk about why he's so good. I don't know, and he gets it not. Not too many people have the ability to hit this five iron as high as he did into the wind he did, and then to land it like he did to get close to this flag. It was yeah. unbelievable. I was behind the shot. It was well. So you've experienced that now of broadcasting where you're behind the player, and that was what I was doing at Ty- with Tyler. And there was one point I remember on the par five. Um, this was at Kingston Heath. I can't remember which hole it was. And I, I, you know, calling it live, said, "Oh, he's hit that way left. That's that could be lost." All of a sudden, it just starts coming around, and he had wanted to come in from the left to the right to avoid the bunkers, and then chased it up, and he had this ten foot putt for eagle. And I thought it had <laughs> gone miles to the left into the tea tree, and it, you know that's that craft, Nick, that mm. you get on the sand belt rather than just going flying straight at flags all the time. That you need to have in your armory around that course. You, you do, and that's the beauty of Royal Melbourne. You, you need to hit. A lot of left to right, a lot of right to left shots coming into greens there. If you if you can only have one trajectory, it's going to be not a boring day for you, for you but you're not going to have too many looks at birdies that, that are reasonable. Just on that, is is the art of shaping the ball being lost? It is. Uh, I think with the, the next generation coming out, what I'm finding, I, I help a few different players, they're a little one-dimensional. Um, so 
I may have spoken about this before, but one thing I love to do with players is to have them take out a half set like we're going to do today um, to help them get a bit more creative with their with their game. I've and got the other eighteen <laughs> in my bag. <laughs> And the other thing is to play without yardages, you know, to actually eyeball it. So today I'll play with a half set and I'm, I won't take in my laser with me and I'll, I'll just go I'm out like, there I'm and, like and, level, and create. Yeah. <laughs> well, you should, though, because what it does is it, it opens your imagination up to all these different shots. And, and, and BJ, you have the creativity as in you can hit those shots. Adam, I'm not so sure you can, but, <laughs> but you actually have the feel. I, I mean, it's, think I do. <laughs> it's one thing to be able to see the shots, you know, these high left to right and low right to left, whatever Tiger did that day. But it's also another thing to be able to execute them. So if you haven't practiced them, they are tough. But but it opens your imagination up to almost play like a kid again. And that's that's the fun part about playing sandbelt golf is there's a variety of different ways you can play the golf courses. See, I don't have a, that laser technology. I just <laughs> I just ask my playing partner, what have I got in here? Or just look for a sprinkler head. That's about yeah. as scientific as it gets for me. Well, they didn't, up until five, six years ago, Royal Melbourne didn't have the yardages on sprinkler heads. Mm. Yeah, well, most golf clubs I have, have, you have the 150 marker, and that's what you look at. Yeah, but I'm just saying that, yeah, they they didn't. It might have been 10 years ago. But yeah. My timeline might be out. But it was it was because the, the club and the board believed that that was one of the skills in golf, is to get a yardage based on feel, sight, and then be able to execute the shot. And But then lasers came out, and it kind of mm. ruined them because they still didn't need them, but then they've, they've, but they've put them on since. But for a long time, they didn't have yardages on on the sprinkler head. I'd, I'd love to talk to you about your match play battles with Tiger, but I want to do that another time. I'm sure. hoping to be able to get you back before the President's Cup actually starts because I think that makes more sense and more appropriate to do it closer to the event. We thought we'd talk about it today because so that we're having a big day down there at Royal Melbourne today and things start to get serious. Mm-hmm. Um, with the, We know the field now, we know the, the teams, and um, I'm sure it's going to be front of mind to a lot of people in the next couple of weeks. Um, but there was a couple of other things I wanted to talk to you about. Firstly, European Tour School, we're getting towards the finality of that. Um, David McAluzzi did an incredible thing just to get through to the, to the last phase, shooting 63 to make it on the number. Have you gone through that process and can you explain the, the pressures involved in not about winning a golf tournament, it's about actually booking yourself a career for mm. 12 months, essentially? It is. I'm- Funnily enough, you know, you talk about Michaluzzi, he, he did he shot sixty three overnight to make the four round cut on the number, which is insane. I mean, I think he was six over par and the cut was going to be two under and he shot eight under par. So that's an amazing feat in itself. I actually did something similar back in the late nineties when I went to European Q school. I came to my last hole on the uh, fourth round, because it's a six round event. After four rounds they have a cut. I had to birdie my last hole. Mm-hmm to make it through and I was in a greenside bunker and I ended up actually holding it for eagle so I got through by I scraped through by one and then that confidence just sort of went on from there and I got my card that way but the entire week is it's one of the most physically and mentally draining weeks you'll ever have in your life and fortunately in Europe I only went through it once and um, when I got through I thought oh this isn't too bad you know (laughs) but you later realize that wow you just don't want to go through that again and there's you know there's a half a dozen Aussies I've seen I've been watching them sort of the scores Jake McLeod's doing really well. He's up there in the top 10. Um, a young fella I've helped out, Jordan Zunick, just yep. made it through. He shot a few under to get through the cut, which is great. And now it's a matter of having you know two really big rounds to, to bring it home. I think they have 25 cards, I believe, and there's probably it was a 60 card or something like that. So now it's it's moving time now to really make, uh, make things go. How um, – you talked about sort of physically and mentally draining. How – because I, I know that there's a lot of times you play golf where people say they don't look at leaderboards and they just play their golf ball and all that sort of thing. How how difficult is it in that process where you know what's at stake? And it's a little bit like trying to hold on to your tour card at the end of the season, mm-hmm. I would imagine, that it's not necessarily about winning an event. It's about actually getting to a particular score to be safe. How do, how do you pl- play that? It's a very tricky uh, proposition because there's no denying it. The result is there. You know what you're playing for. Now, how do you take that from your front of your mind and put it to the back of the mind? That's the real key. And and the guys that can do that the best, well, they're the ones that end up with their cards at the end of the week. If you, if it's constantly at the front of your mind, it's you're going to struggle all week because golf is about playing, uh, going through your process, and then the result takes care of itself. If you're constantly focusing on the result, which is trying to get your tour card, I have to shoot this, I have to do that, it's a really, really tough week, and that's why it's mentally draining because, in a way, you, you're constantly reminding yourself to forget about that. You're constantly saying, look, just forget about score. Let's focus on this shot process, process the whole way. And then at the end of the round, you come off and you're feeling pretty drained, and then you look at the scores and you go from there. 
you may get to the last round in a Q school and go, well, I know I've got to shoot six or seven under. Let's just attack. It's really, in a way, it's almost trickier when you're on the bubble. You're right on the number and you, you're saying to yourself, well, let's not screw up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's like saying, well, you know, in football or whatever sport, oh, let's not miss this, um, mm. which is, a, you know, as soon as you say that, guess what's going to happen? So um, <laughs> taking it from the front of your mind to the back is, is the hardest place and, and it's just a having the presence and the, and the awareness to be able to do that over each and every shot. So my father-in-law, he has a what he describes as a water ball. So when he goes to a hole where there's water, he puts the good golf balls back in the bag and <laughs> takes out an old one. Uh, just What's he thinking he's just about? Accepting the fact that he's probably going to go in the water. He feels it releases the mind. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so from you that have had that sort of process-driven um, sport, BJ, in football, does that help you with your golf? I mean, again, for those that don't know, you play off plus one, plus two. Does, does it help being a professional athlete in another sport to understand what Nick's talking about as opposed to a mug like me who wants to play entertaining golf every time he goes uh, out Well, I think so, but it's not to say that every professional sportsman deals with it like appropriately or the right way. So there's still a number of footballers that I've or heaps of footballers that struggle to deal with that side of the game and stick to the process and in big games where their mind wanders and what it does or when they get have a shot at goal. Mm. That's 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 the biggest correlation between golf and football is the shot at goal. We've got more time to think about it, think about consequences, think about results. That's that's the because because in in play you don't footy's so fast you don't have time to think. Oh, and if you do, you you completely kind of screwed do you yeah. know what I mean you're in a different you're, you're two seconds too late all that kind of thing so if you majority of the time most guys are just playing in the moment in football it happens so quick so you don't have time to think about consequences and too much it's all instinctive but when you have a shot on goal then you've got time to think about things yeah and that's that's the biggest correlation between the two but um there's definitely I think I've dealt with that pretty well over in, in my career and I've, I've tried to help a number of golfers do that um, a couple of younger kids at Metro, just about staying in the moment, thinking about the process, not about results. Almost, you know, for me, like having a shot at goal, like there's there's only, say, in the two teams I played for, that there may only been two or three guys that if you said you've got a shot to win the game, the grand final or a game, who wants it? And I reckon there might have been a couple said, yeah, give me the ball. Hmm. But then, and then you delve into why, well, Deep down, it's well. I'm willing to deal with the consequences if I miss, because yep. not a lot of the other guys want to do that. Yeah, they don't. They don't want. To, they don't want to take the risk to be great. You got to take the risk to kick the goal and put yourself out there and to be great. You got to take a risk, whether it be whether it kick a goal or be successful in in Nick's in 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 every walk of life. You got to take a risk, but not many willing people are willing to take that risk because it makes them vulnerable, and the odds are that they're probably going to fail. But they don't want to deal with the consequences or the fallout from it. So there's like there's this lesson in that that I'm that I try and talk to the golfers and mm. footballers about that you know have that confidence to do it, put your hand up and to deal with the consequences. That's what that's what makes people great and mentally tough and we can, yeah. remember, we can delve into it. But mm. yeah, across all sports, I think the best ones uh, are not afraid to fail. That's probably the, the 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 message there is when they're in those situations. If they do miss, they can they can handle it um, because they put their hand up and they want the ball. Michael Jordan in, in yeah, basketball, he always yeah. wanted the ball at the end. And if he missed, well, he missed and he could handle that and deal with it because he, he just felt, well, I'm going to learn from that and improve and move on. And same in golf. You can look like an idiot so many times in golf because it's just you. And you're out there and you're very, you know, it's a very singular sport, obviously, and you can look like an egghead. Then trust me, I've, I've done the, it. The extre- <laughs> yeah, the, well, the extremes in golf yeah. and, say, football, you, you, you miss it. You kick a point in football, but here you, yeah. it's... Everything's oh, like yeah. magnified. It's like yeah. hitting Absolutely. it way left, or you know, he's, he's choking. He's a choker. Yeah. But see, the amazing thing with golf is the lack of emotion that you see. So I'll give an example. Last night I was up um, quite late watching <laughs> Tommy Fleetwood, and you know, in the first playoff hole, um, he's in a really strong position, and he hits the ball. He had a tough lie, but he hit the ball into the grandstand on the on the playoff hole, and then got a drop in the you know they have that little drop zone. And he's hit the ball from about, well, it was probably about a 30-meter chip mm-hmm. over the bunker from the Kaiku rough to about seven feet, holds the putt, wins the playoff. And as soon as that last ball went in, he just was a complete emotional mess. Mm. You know, he couldn't even do the interview afterwards because he was all choked up with emotion. Now, when we've you all, watch... We've all cried on the, 
national television. That's right. When, <laughs> when, but when you when you watch golf, particularly, you don't see the emotion because it's conditioned that you can't mm. show it. Now you might get the fist pump or whatever, but you know you're not allowed to throw clubs or do any of that sort of thing. But someone like Tommy Fleetwood, well, you think is just ah oh, well, if he misses, he doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Well, it clearly showed how much it did matter to him when he held it, which makes it even more impressive to execute under the pressure. It is, yeah, and, and golf is a different sport because it's played over such a long period of time. So you could imagine going through that emotional roller coaster. If after every putt you hold, you start fist pumping and running around like a bit of a whatever, um, you know, you can do it in other sports because, it, in a way, the games are shorter. Plus, other sports are more physical, so you almost want to let out that emotion. You want to almost get it out. Whereas in golf, if you do that, it can affect your next shot. So that's why you see in golf, people just stay so level, I think, throughout. And then as it comes towards the end of a tournament where someone's making a bit of a charge, you get the fist pumps going just to G themselves up, but they never go too far. And then right at the end when they do win an event, as you said with Tommy, I think all that release just comes out because you've you've kept it in for, for four days, basically, because you don't want to think about winning because if you do, you're probably not going to. So yeah. that end result of I've actually won, I mean, it can just hit you in different ways. Some people just can't talk. Some people go nuts. There's a variety of things. Others cry. You know, it's just an amazing thing to watch. So I'm going to put myself and yourself under pressure here at the same time because I, I, if I remember correctly, when you won your first major in Australia, you had to mm. get up and down from the bunker to win, I think. Yeah, well, a really t- difficult bunker shot that you had to hit. Well, you talk about a, a roller coaster of emotions and was saying about, you know, don't be afraid of it. I missed a three foot putt to win the Australian PGA in 2006. And then I hold a bunker shot on the fourth playoff hole to win. Yeah. It was, you know, you talk about feeling like it, I wanted to bury myself to, you know, being on top of the world all within an hour. It was amazing. So t- talk us through the two things the missed putt mm-hmm. and what were you nervous before you had the putt? Mm hmm. And so, what? How? What does that? How does that impact your impact your putting stroke when you're so nervous? Because you don't you don't see it. And you might have your glasses on or your body. Yeah, no, you. totally. So, what what's going through? Because I'm sure there's people out there that are playing mm-hmm. might be playing on a Saturday where they get nervous when they've got a putt to win, or it might be to break ninety for the first time. How do you control your emotions, and how do you how does it get the better sure. of you? Well, I freely admit that I did not control my emotions on that seventy second hole. I I was thinking about my acceptance speech, things like that as I'm walking over, up over to the ball. So I wasn't thinking about my process. I just, it was a three-foot putt. I thought, yep, I've got this, no problem. As I got over the ball, I actually thought, hmm, I actually haven't taken my time here. What am I doing? And rather than backing away, I just hit the putt, which was the wrong thing to do. So, yes, I, I mean, I'm, I talk about the mental game now, and I've completely mm. screwed up as well like everyone else out there, I'm sure. So the good news was afterwards I thought, okay, let's, let's learn from this. We're still, we haven't lost the tournament. I'm still in it. The first playoff hole had have the exact same putt to keep the playoff going. And the beauty about golf is the and any sport, the sooner you learn, the sooner you get better. And I learnt from my mistake and I thought, well, I've got the same putt. What do I have to do? I have to focus on the process of a three-foot putt. I got over it. I knocked it in. Didn't really even think about it. It was just an automatic reaction. So it was great. I'd learnt from that. And then holding a bunker shot towards the end was just one of those freak things that, hey, I was trying to hold it. If it goes in, great. If it doesn't. Um, so be it. But the whole thing about, you know, the uh, towards the end of the tournament and learning from your mistakes is so key. If I if I beat myself up completely after missing that three foot putt, I would have never have won the playoff. But because I was able to get it over it really quickly, to say to myself, well, look, I'm human. I'm going to miss three foot putts. Unfortunately, it happened at the wrong time. Um, I'll miss another three foot putt at some point. But you know, the next one I have, I'm going to try and do my best and and see what happens. And unfortunately that next three foot part of that I had, I did make it. And then I moved on and the game has a way of um, almost repaying you in, in ways, I think. So when you walk into the bunker to the shot you hold, as mm-hmm. you said, you weren't necessarily trying to hold. It. Well, I was, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you are you nervous about someone at your level of blading it through the back of the green <laughs> or leaving in the bunker? Or are you that confident in your ability, even under that pressure... Because I often think about that when the golfers go in there. Are they nervous or are they going, oh, this is just what I do. I'm going to mm. get it out and I'm going to get it close. The, there is a level of nerves, but if that's what you're focusing on, you, you are going to hit a bad shot. So I've, we've trained ourselves in a way to go, okay, what's my process? You know, And so each and every shot, that's what we're trying to key into. If you do focus on results, 
bad things usually happen. Yeah. So on that particular bunker shot, it's funny. I never saw the water. That if I did yeah. blade it, it would be quite in the water. a downhill. Yeah, lie it as was. Well. Yeah, but I had a nice lie. I just bunkers is my strength, and I got in there, and you just have that feeling of oh, this feels nice. Yep, I can sort of see the line I want. I'm going to splash it out, and if it goes in, it goes in. If it doesn't, well, I'll make par, and we'll we'll either move on to the next playoff hole or whatever. And as soon as I hit it, it just felt really good. So, but the key to that whole thing was. Once I got in and dug my feet in, I was I was in process mode. I wasn't in results. And for every golfer out there, if you can execute a good process on every shot you hit in your next round of golf, I can promise you that you're not going to hit every shot perfect, but I can also prom- promise you that your results are probably going to be better than if you just focus on the result for every shot. This is, this is like, it, it gives you, it gives you, so good. It gives you the best <laughs> chance or the best opportunity to hit a good shot or to succeed. Yeah. And now it's not going to happen every time. The more you do it, you, you know, you're giving yourself the best chance to do it. So when I go out for a round of golf, I don't actually think about, I'm going to play the best physical game I can today. I actually go, I'm going to have the best mental game that I can have today. If I have the best mental game, my physical game basically follows suit. I can have a good physical game, but if I don't think do I have a good mental game, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to shoot a good score. So that kind of tells you where you should, what you should be focusing on. Fascinating insights, Nick. It's so awesome that you come in and share them because I know I get a lot out of it personally. But for those that are listening, you, you can't it can't not help your game because, uh, as as you've said many times before, the mental side of it is is so important in every sport, I think, but particularly in golf. And um, mm. well, yeah, we might be paired today. We can work on it today. <laughs> oh, no, you wouldn't want to be paired with me. I'd ask you far too many questions. Uh, we've got to take a break. Uh, Craig Parry. Um, is going to join us after this. And we think of uh, so many times uh, through the last 20 years, Nick Ahern and Craig Parry at the top of so many leaderboards. So it'll be great to have uh, the two of them on together. This is the PJ Golf Club. Everything you want to know about Aussie golf is in one place. PGA.org.au. This is the official site of the PGA of Australia. It's the one website loaded with all the tournament, course and player news. That includes the latest on the ISPS Hander PGA Tour of Australasia. The Find a PGA Pro directory will track down the pros near you. And here's where you can live stream golf's best on PGA TV. Watching tournaments live, streaming replays or watching the latest reports on Aussie golfers around the world. There are even video tips from the pros. So if golf's your game, this is your site. pga.org.au from the Professional Golfers Association of Australia. Driving Australian golf since 1911. And welcome back to the PGA Golf Club. Our feature chat this week is with Craig Parry. And we all remember Craig Parry for a number of different things he did over his career, but particularly when we think of the President's Cup, we think of Craig Parry and Shigeki Mariyama and uh, the success they had at the 98 edition of the President's Cup at Royal Melbourne. Of course, it's back at Royal Melbourne in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Craig, thanks very much for your time. Yeah, not a problem at all. It sounds like a long time ago. Um, does it feel like a long time ago when you think <laughs> back to that uh, successful time? It actually feels like yesterday. Um, it, it doesn't feel like it was uh, such a, a long time ago. I mean, I re- remember it very vividly and, um, you know, it was great memories. What was the thing that stood out to you most? Uh, how the team got on. The cup was pretty impressive. Um, you know, the first international team to do that as well. Um, you know, it, it, as I say, everyone got on really well and uh, the, the team played exceptional golf. So we talked a bit about this already, but certainly it's something that Ernie Els and Jeff Ogilvie have spoken about around how you get that team camaraderie and that team feel when it is an international team and people have sort of thrown together from all, all parts of the, of the globe. How did you do it so successfully that it became a, a real key to your success? Well, I, I didn't do it. It was really Wayne Grady and Peter Thompson that got the team to gel really well together. Um, you know, because you've got all these players from all over the world that don't play Ryder Cup, and you you put them together, and you, you try and make a team out of it. Whereas the Americans, it's a lot easier to do because obviously they're from one country. But, um, you know, Grays was fantastic, and so was Peter. What what, what did they do, Paz? What what was what was the big? Okay, well, in the in the players' uh, tent to start with, it was two two separate uh, tables. And Grade says, no, we don't have any separation. 
you know, caddies were on one side, players were on the other. It was, he found it into one big table. And the very first day that we left the golf course, there was an esky in the bus, and grades went up to open up the esky, and it had American beer. And he said, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> Jumped off the bus, went and grabbed Australian beer, and said, right, now we're ready to go. And th- that's how it started. And my my mate, Geki, he, he got gets up in the bus on the way home and starts singing karaoke on the way home <laughs> going along the Peen Highway. <laughs> so that that's how the, the team really got on really well. And, you know, you had Peter Thompson telling stories of, you know, when he won a British Open with a borrowed set of golf clubs and had to give them back the very next Monday after the tournament he just won. <laughs> and what about some of the players that were, were in, in that team? Because looking back on it, it was pretty kind of star started when you really think about it. When I mean, Nick Price, Ernie Owls was only 29, and Greg Norman, as you Yeah, look, look, we had, we had a very good team at that, that point. Elkington was playing fantastic golf. You had VJ who was playing great golf. I mean, Nobolo was playing good. Turner was playing good. We were all playing really well. And, and that made it a lot easier to be confident going out and playing when your teammates are doing what they need to do. And, you know, when they got into trouble, they just hit amazing shots to get out of trouble. And and you guys got off to a flyer, didn't you, Paz? I mean, on that uh, first first day, I think you, you guys really dominated them. And then by almost the end of Saturday, going into the singles, you had a, a lead which was, was, was pretty hefty, I believe. So, um, I mean, maybe you can remind us of how you sort of got off to that momentum. Was that just through the team bonding to begin with? Yeah, I think it was, Nick. Mm-hmm. I, I really do. I, I think the team got on so well. And obviously... We we were there as a team, whereas the Americans, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, the Americans were there as individuals. And you know, when they went out to the golf course, they were all going out by uh, their their own transportation in individual cars. Whereas in, in a national team, we went out by bus. Everything that we did, we did as a team. Mm, sounds like the European Ryder Cup taste with those guys. They bonded really well as a team. But you also played, I think you had a couple of matches with Shigeki Mariyama, right? I mean, how did that sort of pairing come about? Yeah, well, Shigeki, I'd been playing up in Japan for many years. And um, I'd known Shigeki for uh, you know, probably five years before we were playing the President's Cup. And, uh, you know, we got on well before the President's Cup. And then all of a sudden we were paired together. And Shigeki, obviously, at that point didn't speak a great deal of English and you know I knew Royal Melbourne very well uh, as a golf course and when you get the different wind conditions coming in at Royal Melbourne you have to take different lines off the tee as you know and dip with the uh, different flag placings as well you had to always hit it under the hole you, you can never hit it above the hole at Royal Melbourne as you know and you know I was able to you know point him in the right direction and you know just say look you know hit it under the hole don't go at the flag here you know, hit it away, we'll, we'll, we'll make our par and get to the next hole. And, you know, quite a few times it worked out pretty good. So when you think back to your career, as we said when we first had a chat, you've won everything there is to win pretty much here in Australia and, and you've won a WGC event on the PGA Tour. Where where does that week sort of stand in, in your career? Uh, look, in, in, like playing team golf and, and international golf, representing Australia, I mean, it doesn't get any better for me. Um, you know, individual honours, you know, they're, they're fantastic as well. But playing team golf and, and getting on really well with your teammates and, you know, that's a bond that lasts a, a lifetime. And Royal Melbourne, the, the, the special the specialness of that place and, and where we'll all get to to look at um, in, a, in a few weeks' time, where does that sit for you? Uh, Royal is the best golf course in Australia, uh, without question. Um, you know, you can play a President's Cup one day, Australian Open the next, and the members can play it the following day. Uh, it's just all about the flag placings and about how you get it around the golf course. And, you know, it's a bit like Augusta National as well. You know, the members go and play it, and they can play it the day after the tournament or even on the Monday of the tournament. And it's just when you put the, the difficult flag placings out, that's when it makes it really, really hard. And, you know, Royal is not going to change this year when they go back there. So if they've done their homework and they've looked at the, the past videos, the flag placings are going to go in the same positions. The putts are still going to break exactly the same as they did, you know, in previous occasions that they've been there. So the, the team that's done the most homework will more than likely win. 
And Craig and I, Adam, no, Craig and I know this uh, the 18th hole very well at, uh, yes. at Royal Melbourne because the, <laughs> all I remember is Paz holding putts on 18 to, yes. to keep this playoff going in a, a 2005 event that we played there for the Heineken. And I'll always remember that day because Jared Lyle was sort of having his breakout, um, you know, after being so sick. And uh, it was a fascinating final day. And I'm thinking, will this guy ever miss a putt? Mm-hmm. And as it turned out, I think... Very unfair of me on that story, <laughs> mate. It was your son giving you putting lessons or something, right? So... <laughs> I was yeah, there that day. I, I, look, I, I putted really well that week. Uh, my sometimes when you when you're getting on the greens and you feel it with your eyes, and that might be a little bit of a, a crazy thing to say, but you know I, I seen the break really well that week, and um, you know obviously playing the Presidents Cup earlier, and then we had the Heineken, and uh, you know I'd played so many rounds and rounds all Melbourne, you just feel it eat. I do remember that very well. Because you were, you were desperate for it, Nick, weren't you? Oh. And Craig had had enough. He'd won enough. He'd this won is, enough. This yeah. is meant to be oh, your yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> now, to, to win around Royal Melbourne, I remember Craig said afterwards, I mean, that's just a, that's got to be the highlight or one of the highlights of your career. You remember golf courses you win around, and I'm sure the people that won it, you know, St. Andrews uh, for the Open, um, all the great courses in America for whatever tournaments they win there. And to, in Australia, it's it's Royal Melbourne for sure. So, Craig, this might sound a bit of a controversial question, but I remember when I was growing up as a, an 11-year-old going to the Bicentennial Classic and seeing Roger Davis win, and that was when I got completely hooked on golf. I was obsessed by it ever, ever since um, with you know, Jack Nicholas and Greg Norman were playing that event. It was a huge event at the time. We now have an Australian summer where we're not on the sand belt at any point apart from the President's Cup. And there were so many more golf tournaments to play in this country. Where, where is, that, is that ever going to change or is this we just got to get used to the fact that that's golf in this country now? Yeah, golf has changed a lot over the years. And what you've got to remember is many, many years ago that there weren't tournaments in Asia that were part of the European Tour or even the US Tour for that matter. And we were really only up against uh, maybe Japan. Uh, so we only had Australia and Japan on. And now you've got South Africa, you've got the Middle East, you've got Asia. And the, the better players in the world can only play so many weeks of the year. And that, that's just one of the realities we have to you know, accept, that we're only going to have maybe one or two big tournaments, and uh, that's it. But did, did, we go to, did we go to sleep on that, though, Paz, allowing... Asia and oh. and South Africa and up these other countries to have big events and and pull I mean, the and players. They're always there. going to come forward because they're, they're big countries in their own right, and they've got the prize money to throw into it. So they're going to lure the the, the better players to go and play in those uh, venues. One of the things I think that really has hurt Australian golf is, is um, being able to watch international golf on on Fox. No doubt. Uh, you know, pay TV and. Yep. You know they can the, the spectator or the people in Australia can watch the best golfers from all over the world on TV. They don't have to go and watch them at the golf tournaments anymore, and it, it's easy to watch them in your own backyard or in your own um, lounge room rather than going to the golf. And you know if you don't get the best field there, people feel as though they're a little bit ripped off. And you know that that's one of the, the difficulties we do have. I think it's a great point, Craig, and I think. That, that, that I mean, this has been an issue now for quite some time, but if you love your golf and you're lucky enough to have subscri- subscription television, you can watch the best in America play in the morning and then you can watch the best in Europe play at night. So it becomes a perception issue when you don't have these really strong fields in Australia because it's like, oh, well, hang on a sec, this isn't the field that we're used to watching on the television each week. And, and that's had an effect on the A-League. It's had an effect on NBL basketball because the very best in the world is so close to home now through through the media. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, that part of it's not going to change. No. And the only way that you're going to be able to get the, the better players in America to come down is either the week after away or the Mercedes or the, the Tournament of Champions at the very first week of the year and you get the players to come in and play. But that's going to cost you $20 million to run that event and have the prize money and... You know, the government can spend that money pretty wisely other than putting it into a golf tournament for one week of the year. Because events like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but events in the past like the Cannon Challenge or the, it was the ANZ Championship there, they were never international sort of star-studded fields. It was the best Australia had to offer. But again, that what you talked about, that, that becomes that perception issue that they go, well, we don't want to watch that. We don't want to watch that. We want to watch the best in the world play, not just the best in Australia. Yeah, that, that's the, the new generation of, of yeah. the, the young folk that want everything 
immediately. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's what we, we have to face. Um, we're, as I say, we're only going to have a couple of tournaments. We've got the Australian Open, the PGA, but it's great to have a, a, a tournament in Melbourne uh, of some kind. Um, you know, you've got to get back to playing golf in, in Melbourne because that does have the best uh, golf courses. What's your view on that, Nick? Is that we have... We just have to get used to it. <laughs> it, you know, it's a generational thing. I, it, exactly what you're talking about. Just the the availability to see all the best players you know, on the box now is is so tough. And that sponsorship dollars, you know, to, to have those big events, you need a lot of money to do it. And putting mm. it into one week of the year, they could spend that same amount of money and probably have a football team for the entire year. So that's that's where the differentiators are in, in golf in that respect. But um, you know, if we can have those that, those three really big events again, the Open, the PGA and we unfortunately lost the Masters but you got the Vic Open sort of coming along I think um, you know there's some there is some potential there it's just a matter of building and growing and getting these you know the best players uh, from Australia to come back for number one and then also them kind of give them their mates a nudge just saying hey um, you mate, why don't you make the trip down um, this year is going to be great obviously with the President's Cup on and the Australian Open um, the week before is going to be ha- have a heck of a field yeah. obviously mostly internationals obviously uh, I think the US team's probably playing Tigers event yeah an advantage for us is maybe they all have jet lag the week <laughs> after. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's very tough to get these guys to come down at that time of the year because they want to have a rest. They've just played so much golf throughout the year. And while we've got... And it's, yeah, sorry, sorry And it's also about the world ranking points as well. Yes. You know, world ranking points mean so much as far as getting in majors. It, that the, the guys that are on the fringe of the top 50, they don't want to come and play in an event that's going to hurt them as far as their world rankings points. If they have to finish, say, fifth in the event just to hold their place in their world rankings, you need more world ranking points to actually try and entice the guys to come down and play as well. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I was I was watching the Ned Bank last night and they talked about how um, in all events on the European Tour played in South Africa, South African golfers nearly win 50% of them. And just the advantage that is obviously for South Africans playing in home conditions, but also that sort of pathway program where so many South Africans are getting through the European tour because obviously if you win, you're on the tour. Um, I thought that was maybe an interesting lesson there that potentially can be learnt for the Australian tour. Um, if we have a couple of events in Australia, that that, that can be a, a lovely pathway program through rather than just hinging on one or two events every year. And in the case of Cam Smith, he's on a tour. He doesn't need the need the the sort of saloon passage through that maybe it needs to go to the second place player or something like that. I don't know. We need to find ways to, to get more players getting onto the main tours. Oh, look, there's no question about that. And, you know, that's, that's one of the tough things. You know, you have to have an event that's, um, you know, in conjunction with the European tour or a PGA tour, but it just costs a lot of money to get mm. done. Um, while we've got in, just before we let you go, and we appreciate your time, Craig, watching golf now, and I oh, know you're still playing as well, but watching the next generation of players th- coming through, who are the ones that stand out to you that we should be watching closely? Uh, some of the young guys, Ryan Ruffles. Yep. Um, Ryan, Ryan is a guy that's on the verge of, of playing exceptional golf. Um, you've got Curtis Luck, another young guy. You know, we, we we do have quite a few coming through and it's just a matter of getting the, the right break at the right time and all of a sudden they'll be away and they'll be off doing what Cameron Smith is doing. And he's doing it really well. Craig, appreciate your time uh, and uh, I'm sure you'll be watching the President's Cup in a few weeks' time and it'll bring back plenty of good memories. All right, no worries, guys. Craig Parry joining us on the PGA Golf Club. We'll be back uh, after this. RSN Podcast, all your favourite RSN shows and loads of new programs. You can listen all download wherever, whenever. And now we're on iHeartRadio, the world's number one radio and podcast app. RSN Podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts and at rsn.net.au. And now on iHeartRadio. It's free at your app store or head to iHeart.com. And welcome back to the PGA Golf Club. But Craig Spence uh, joins us, as he always does, from the Albert Park Driving Range. He's not in the studio today. He's on the phone, but he's uh, still with us. Craig, thanks for your time as always. Hey, fellas. How's it going? We're going very well. Very thank good. You. But uh, this is always my favourite White is White is better now that you're on the phone. Exactly right. We, free lesson before free he plays lesson, today. Free lesson playing today, <laughs> Craig. So this, I want you to have my mind with real clarity. I don't want it clouded, all right? So just be careful okay. with what you say today. Uh, what are we going to talk about? 
All right, today we're going to talk about the difference between hitting um, drivers versus irons. One of the most common questions I get when people come into the Albert Park driving range is, is, is it the same swing? Like, what do you guys think? Do you think that the driver swing is the same as the iron swing? Well, don't ask me. Uh, ask the people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes and, and no. <laughs> well, it is different because when you think about a nine iron and basically you've got a you know significantly short club, um, got about you know 40 odd degrees loft on it versus a driver that's 45, maybe 46 inches long, has a long graphite shaft with a different flex point, but also the fact that it's got a big curved head on it with a um, about 9.5 or 10.5 degrees loft. The realities are that there's significant differences. Now, um, we might we might just talk about the driver first, right? So we think about when we when we set up the driver, first of all, the ball position is well forward, has to be just inside your front foot. And also, when you stand, your body will be a little bit different to an iron because you'll have your right shoulder significantly down. If I'm, I'm talking about a right hander, sorry, Nick O'Hearn, you That's okay, mate. feel like I'm getting you. she's getting left out <laughs> in the dark all the time. But the um, reality is that you know, 90% of golfers are right-handed. So, um, so as a right-hander, your right shoulder at setup should be quite significantly lower than left because you've got a bit of what we call spine tilt. So immediately when you think about there's already a setup difference between driver and a 9 iron or an 8 iron or a 7, um, you don't have to have very much tilt with those shorter irons. So the next step, once you get your setup different with a driver and plus the ball is teed up in the air, is that when you swing... You will, you will create what we call release with a driver a lot more significantly than with a iron. And the reason for this is that because the club is longer and has less loft, you need to you need to feel the release of the club earlier to get it back to square. That's why you see an enormous amount of beginners hit the ball way out to the right, especially with their driver, because they don't understand that the club needs to release a lot earlier on the downswing to get back to square. And and it's really important the club gets to square with driver because the less loft on the club face, the more chance that it goes to the right um, immediately because it has no loft to help it sort of straighten out. So any, anything that's not square when you've got less loft goes offline quicker. So um, a lot of people then ask me when I, in my lessons is, okay, well, what is release? Um, how do you feel it? What, do you roll your hands? And it, Rolling your hands is actually wrong because what that does is it changes the face angle too quickly. So, and I hope I'm not, Adam, I hope I'm not getting too technical here for, um, are you following with me? I'm starting to get a bit nervous, but no, 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 I am. <laughs> I am. I am. All right, so... Release is just a fancy word, really, for when you when you swing down. There's a point where you where you sort of your body allows the club to catch up. So um, it's obviously a fairly athletic motion, the the golf swing. But essentially, what happens is as you come down towards the ball, your body is turning and rotating, but the club's also almost trailing the body a little bit. But there's a point with which you should almost slow your body right down and allow the club to catch up to you and almost pass you. And that is the release point. And you'll really feel it in the hands. And we do that in lots of motions. We do that in tennis. We do that in throwing a ball. So it's not an unnatural movement. It's a very natural movement. It's just one that sometimes you need a little bit of help and advice on how to do it. But you have to allow your you have to allow the release to occur in it with the driver and you have to allow it to occur earlier with the driver than with a nine iron. And when I say earlier, I mean quite, quite quickly from the top, you have to start to feel the release happen. Um, so I thought I'd give a couple of tips on how you can practice release. 
one one great tip is to is to do some swings with your feet together, right? So your your feet are actually touching, and you just just swing the club. And what you'll notice is that your your body will automatically stall, and the club will sort of pass by you. And that that's again that's the feeling of the weight of the club passing the body, and that's that's a feeling of release. Um, another Another feel of release that you can practice is to do baseball practice swings where you hold the club up in the air about waist height, about level with your belt buckle, and do some swings. And again, you'll feel the club will, will swing past your your body. You'll actually feel the weight of the club head um, release past you, and you'll feel it in the hands and the arms that goes by. Um, and a really technical drill would be to do a one-hand, right-hand practice swing and um, that one particularly is good because you don't have much power over the club. You can um, you can feel the weight of the club significantly. So that's three that's three things you can practice in practice swings just to get the feeling of release. Um, and then you can tell whether you're doing it correctly by where the ball's going. So if you're a right-hander and you and you're not releasing early enough, the ball will be taking off directly to the right you'll, you'll notice the ball and play around with it try try to release it as early as possible and see if you can get the ball starting to your left quicker um, and once you get a bit of a feel for it you can try to embed it and get some consistency going but I do advise everyone to rush down and see me at Albert Park driving range for a lesson on how to do this and uh, just kidding um, but it's it is a really important part of hitting the drive straight for those people that, that get sick of that slice and that block. So um, I was yeah. going to say to Craig that you're talking about the, the drives go out to the right. It's not a slice. It's more a block when you when the but, ball goes out to the right because you, you, the trajectory can often just go, I'm speaking from experience here, just go straight into the trees or into the next fairway and you're thinking, I didn't slice that and I didn't aim it there. It just went there. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right, Adam. But what happens is that people get sick of the ball starting to the right, and instead of learning to release the club, what they do is they start pulling the path to the left more yep. to try to get the ball to start more left. But as we know, what that creates now is the slice. So you might now you might now be starting it a little bit more online, but now it's really carving off to the right after it's hit. So I was going to say that um, things that will really impact your ability to, to learn to release it are if you have that severely open club face. Um, so, look, it is a radio show and it is um, general information, but which, but it's for people who have that really open club face or really crooked swing path, um, that really needs help from a PJ professional to really get that back in a squarer position so that the, the release can really benefit you um, but yeah, the open club face will make the release very difficult. It's hard to talk to Nick about this because he never missed a fairway. He's always just straight down <laughs> no, the middle I every know. time. It's so it's a sort of foreign language uh, for Nick talking about these sorts of things. But was there something that you f- say with your driver that if you were doing something wrong that was something that was uh, not so much repeatable, but did you mm. have the same problem that you need to fix all the time or did you have different problems? For me it was, yeah. If anything... Exactly what Craig's talking about, leaving out out for the to the right for a right hander. For me, it was to the left. Um, I love the drills Craig just mentioned there. He's spot on. The feet together is good. Baseball swings. Something that helped me feel a bit more release in my swing was I'd actually take, let's see, for a right hander, it would be your top hand, so your left hand. Take the uh, the pinky and the ring finger actually off the club. Um, so you move your index and your middle finger to the to the end. So, yep. the, so those last two are hanging off. Okay. And just swing smoothly, and you'll be amazed how much more the club feels as though it releases through the ball. It's just a great little okay. drill. You can just hit drivers like that normally if you, if you like, and you'll feel more of a release, which is exactly what Craig's talking about. That helped me. That's very Ad, Adam, Adam, that's a great point Nick brings up, is that is he's talking about a certain way of releasing grip pressure. And uh, people... I often ask professionals how hard they hold the club and they say, I don't know, three, two out of ten. And most amateurs I speak to with a seven or eight is their answer. Oh, and yeah. Especially really if you're trying to get 350 metres, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be 11 out of ten. <laughs> you'd be amazed because 
what release does with a light grip pressure, it creates speed. It creates yep. a lot of speed down the bottom. So people people eliminate that when they try to create arm speed and, and, and strong grip pressure. They really eliminate speed. Yeah. Spencer, what about, what, talk about uh, as an amateur, and I still do it occasionally, but when you get driver, you think you've got to hit it harder than, let's say, a, a, a seven or a six iron. But just talk about the, the tempo in a golf swing and your driver as opposed to or why it shouldn't be really any different to hitting a, a seven or a six iron and that, the, that you get extra speed out of a longer lever anyway. Yeah, well, because that lever, as you say, Brandon, because that club head's so far away from you, the arc is a lot bigger. And therefore, you can create significant speed in a driver versus a nine iron. But I, um, I was the same as you, Brandon, where I would... I would get long and and my sequence would get all over the place and I would lose up to 30, 40 metres. Um, and that was frustrating. I knew I was capable of hitting at a certain distance, but when my tempo was out, I was way back. So some of the things I would try would be shorten the backswing up a little bit and slow the tempo down and, until I could really feel the sequence working with my body and my and my club. So... Um, feet together is a brilliant one for getting not only release but getting tempo back um, because you're relying on, on balance and the feet together will, will restrict overturning and swaying and things like that. So I, I, I really advise to shorten up your arm swing a little bit if your tempo is out. And, you know, a lot of guys count, do counting drills. There's the old famous Ernie L's, Ernie on the back swing and L's on the, on the follow through. Um, <laughs> Or some people even respond to watching players with really good tempo on YouTube um, and just copying that tempo that makes sense to their eye. So, yeah, it's, it's a constant battle, that one. The, the last question I've got for you, Craig, before we, we let you go is, we were talking last week about alignment, and, and that is where you actually sort of address when you've got a driver as opposed to, say, a seven iron. Is the, is the ball set up in the middle of the stance or is the ball set up more towards your front foot? With, with the driver? Or yeah, the with a driver, with a driver. Yeah, look, the, dri- the, the, ball, the ball has to be up near the front foot. Probably a general rule is just on the inside um, of your front foot. Now, that is really so that, that you've got an opportunity for the club to square up. Remember, the club yep. swings on an arc, right? And a bit like a gate closing the club face won't actually close until it gets around past the point of the middle of your body, level with your, with your leading shoulder. So put the ball forward so that it has an opportunity to square up. Um, if it's further back in your stance, it'll still be open when it hits the ball. And also it'll still be de-lofted because of that arc, that the loft is not able to get to its maximum loft until it gets level with your left shoulder. So... Um, or lead shoulder yeah. to help all our left-handers out there as well. Yeah, because I, mean, I think it's an interesting one that um, a lot of people just address the club in the, with the ball in, in the middle of your feet because that's just what you think you have to do. You don't actually know that you have to be different for each club. Anyway, that might be a, a conversation for another day. I, I think next week we might be giving Brendan Goddard a, a session because he's he's lost his confidence with his golf. He's not playing very well. <laughs> It's, okay. it's it's deeply satisfying for me that this is happening to him and not to me. <laughs> so he's he's going to give it another week, and if there's still some problems, uh, it, it's it may be I've just got to a, I've been playing too it may just be a situation where Brendan's on the couch and you're just giving him some assistance. <laughs> yeah, on the range, you got club <laughs> temps well, coming up too. Yeah. Maybe I'm still going to pass that along with the wife. All my tips too much, and I've got inside his head a bit. Well, yeah. maybe but, um, I do I feel it's just me and you talking in these segments, Craig. But you know, it's good to get Brendan involved. I'm trying to shallow out, that. mate. I'm trying to shallow I've out. I've also I've set myself a bit of homework. We'll see how we need to go with Brendan first. But I'm next week. I thought I might bring the five tips that your mates give you that ruin your golf game. <laughs> yes, because I'm telling you, I don't know what it is about golf, but every mug knows exactly what's wrong with your golf game, and they they can't wait to tell you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now that, that sounds good. That sounds good. Craig, thanks very much for. Joining us, uh, as always, we'll do it all again next week. All right. Thanks, fellas.
See ya. That is uh, Craig Spence joining us uh, and also Nick Ahern again uh, coming in. Uh, it was great to sort of reminisce about the President's Cup and talk about how to play around Royal Melbourne, all those sorts of things. Um, it's great to see you again, Nick. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Adam. Cheers, mate. And Brendan, good luck today and good luck in your Thanks, search mate. for your form over the next week. To you too. I think you'll need I'm it more fine. than I. Oh, I'm, you're I'm fine. fine. Oh, geez, you're in a good Always space, going with you? a very positive mindset. Uh, yep. I tend to end differently, but you're always going to go in with a very positive mindset. Uh, golf, don't we all love it? We'll catch you next week.